Welcome to Coffee with the Candidates. Today's edition will have candidates for Prosecuting Attorney, District 8 North, Blake Montgomery and Ben Hale. Hi, I'm April from SWARC today and welcome to this segment of Coffee with the Candidates. We are coming to you from our studio in downtown Hope and this morning I have with me Ben Hale, candidate for Prosecuting Attorney. Thanks for being here. Yeah, thanks April. Glad to be here. To get us started, can you give citizens a definition of what exactly a prosecuting attorney does? Yeah, there's a lot of things that we do that a lot of people don't know about. Uh, generally, the biggest thing is felony prosecutions. Okay. So the state of Arkansas is divided up into 28 judicial districts. Mm -hmm. uh, we're one, uh, two counties, Hempstead and Nevada County. Mm -hmm. So we handle all felony prosecutions, all misdemeanors, all traffic violations, all game and fish violations. Okay. We're also responsible for uh, mental health commitments, involuntary commitments, um, substance abuse commitments, juvenile court, which is delinquencies and families in need of services petitions. Yeah. Um, the, we also do civil asset forfeitures for tied to drug cases. Mm -hmm. We also act as the county attorney. So we advise the court, the court, court county mm -hmm. judges on county business uh, by statute. That's kind of because yeah. we, have, we have a little bit of immunity being uh, representative of the state, so we, okay. we advise all the uh, county officials. Okay. Well, can you let voters know a little bit about your background? Sure. Uh, I grew up in Prescott, a uh, proud graduate of Prescott High School. Uh, I graduated in 2005. I was valedictorian. Um, my wife is also from Prescott. We both went to the University of Arkansas at Fayetteville. Proud Razorbacks. <laughs> um, the... 2018, uh, Christy McQueen gave me an opportunity to work as a deputy prosecutor okay. after I passed the bar exam and uh, been doing it for the last four years. Very proud of that. I uh, grew up in the Methodist Church in Prescott, big golfer, uh, played in high school. Mm -hmm. And uh, when I started dating my wife, Lizzie, we started going to a place of meeting in Perrytown, okay. uh, Jerry Crane's Church, Nathaniel Crane's Church, and uh, we've been going there ever since. So. Uh, we've got our first baby on the way. Congratulations. Thank you. Yeah, it's actually doing election day of all days. So. Oh, that's funny. <laughs> yeah, so we've been, uh, credit to my wife, She's uh, she's been working really hard and uh, hitting the streets. And, yeah, I think she's looking for campaign signs for somewhere to go <laughs> use the restroom whenever she's, you know, walked too much. So, um, but yeah, hopefully the baby's healthy and uh, we're excited about that. So. That's good. Well, which experiences do you think have prepared you for public office? Well, I think <clears throat> I think the biggest thing about me is, um, you know, I've after I graduated law school, I uh, actually tried to start a business. I didn't take the bar exam right after yeah. law school. And I think, you know, that was an important experience in my life because, you know, I had a good idea. Uh, I actually acquired a patent for the idea, but it didn't work out. And uh, business was not successful, so it was very humbling. Yeah. And uh, I think that's a very important um, part of my history because I actually had to uh, work for a moving company for a period of time. Yeah. And uh, some of the people I worked with were struggling with substance abuse addiction. And uh, it really shed a light uh, for me how hard it is for people that are um, barely making enough to, mm -hmm. to get by. And then they have their own problems, their own demons yeah. that they're fighting. Um, at the time, I started doing it part time so I could keep trying to work on the business before you know I realized it just wasn't going to make it. So, uh, but what was funny is because it was a business, a lot of legal issues kept coming up, kept coming up. And they're like, "Oh, you've got a law degree." Yeah. You know, uh, talk to me about it, and uh, so I did, and uh, I started to realize, you know, I've got this experience, this education. Um, I, I, you know, it's it's a it's a waste not to mm -hmm. use that to help people. And so I just made up my mind that I was going to come home and take the bar exam, and I did. And I passed, and I was very grateful. That's the hardest, <laughs> hardest test uh, I've ever ever had to take. Yeah. It's like uh, 15 uh, law school classes in, uh, in two-day tests. So we uh, proud of that. And But the, <clears throat> the overall experience uh, was humbling um, because you go through a, a period where you know, you, you have these ideas and you want to take them to life and sometimes it just doesn't work out quite the way that you want to. Yeah. Uh, but there's growth in that too. Um, and I think being grounded uh, prepares me for public office because I'm able to put myself in the position of others. You mm -hmm. know, most of the cases that we look at 
are people that have had a bad day. Um, and we were, usually we're seeing people on their worst day, uh, yeah. the reports. Um, so I think having that, you know, uh, humility and having that uh, understanding that, you know, we all make mistakes, we yeah. all uh, fall short, um, we still have to learn from it. Mm -hmm. We still have to take those and turn them into a positive. The best thing that happened from that was uh, being exposed to a lot of people that were in recovery. Mm -hmm. um, I didn't quite, I mean, I've had family members, you know, that yeah. had problems with addiction. Um, but I really didn't know, you know, how hard it is to, to get out to the other side. And um, so it's, it was a good experience. Um, Having done that, when I talk to you know people um, about what they're going through, I think it it allows me to have empathy um, and really uh, try to put myself in, in their shoes. I uh, know I'm kind of rambling a little bit, so you may want to cut. No, it's this. okay. Uh, um, but the point being is that um, when you have <clears throat> have that experience, um, we have a job to do. And you try to think about how can we hold the person accountable for generally what they've done wrong, mm -hmm. or how can we help someone that really does just need help? Yeah. And um, my big thing uh, as a prosecutor is, you know, a lot of the people on our docket, first time offenders or mm -hmm. people on struggling with substance abuse, which is the biggest problem in our community. Um, that's what we're trying to do. And so that's really. You know, I think served me well as a prosecutor. Okay. Well, what or who inspired you to enter this election? Well, um, my opponent had already announced, you know, way uh, early on. Um, my boss indicated that she was going to retire. And um, really, it was one of those situations where, you know, if I don't run, uh, we know that the thing, the way we've been doing things and, mm -hmm. um, people in our office probably didn't have a lot of job security yeah so um, being the most qualified person in our office and being from Nevada County yeah um, I was deciding that this is what I want to do uh, to represent the people I already knew I wanted to be a prosecutor uh, I wish I had a little more time to learn under someone yeah um, but I'm grateful uh, mm -hmm. that I've had the experience that I've had and I ready to be the prosecutor. So. Okay. Are there any specific issues you're most concerned about, should you be elected, that you want to concentrate on? Well, I think there's quite a few. Uh, I think a lot of people don't quite understand what's going on um, from a legal issue. Um, you know, the law changes. It's not, it's not static. It's dynamic. Mm -hmm. and we have legislatures that are legislators that uh, continue to create new laws that our office is responsible for prosecuting. Uh, one one big problem that we face is we only have a little over 16,000 prison beds in the state of Arkansas. Uh, as a state, we filed over 50,000 felony cases last year. Mm -hmm. It doesn't take a rocket scientist to figure out that that math doesn't make, yeah. make sense anymore. Those numbers don't add up. And so what has happened, um, and it's really kind of a budgetary tool, um, but legally, what's happening is parole eligibility has really eroded. We don't have truth in sentencing anymore. So mm -hmm. when somebody says they get 20 years, you know, they're out in two or three. Okay. Or, um, and then there's this real neat legislative tool called the Emergency Powers Act, where if the jails get backed up with defendants that are being sentenced to prison um, above a certain number, they just let people that are serving a sentence that oh. my office and other prosecutors worked hard uh, yeah. to obtain a jury or a court imposed and they're just paroled out to make room for the defendants that have been newly sentenced. That's not sustainable. Yeah. Um, so we really need comprehensive reform. We need people that understand um, not all criminal cases are created equally uh, in terms of the sentence that's being imposed. And so what we've truly really tried to do in our office and I'm proud of, there are certain offenses that where it is much more um, serious in terms of the uh, truth in sentencing, if that makes mm -hmm. sense. For instance, everybody's familiar with murder, and, uh, 
but when you get a life sentence, you're not eligible for parole in Arkansas. And we don't have a lot of murders, thankfully. Um, hope to keep it that way. But the next most serious um, crime that you can prosecute is sexual assaults for mm-hmm. a victim under 14. It carries with it a mandatory 25 years flat. Uh, one positive change the legislature did make, and we've been very vigilant in, is they took a page out of the, the uh, federal prosecutor's playbook where if uh, you're found guilty of possessing a firearm and you've been convicted of a violent felony, you're not eligible for parole. And so since that's happened, we've really gone after those cases because yeah. that allows us to remove some serious violent criminals from mm-hmm. our community. And um, very proud of that. Another thing I think our community needs, we've got to get back to community service. Um, one of, you know, just because prison generally is, you know, four walls, uh, there could also be financial prisons. Mm-hmm. And generally what's going on with a lot of cases, you only have fines that are imposed. Well, a lot of people don't understand that the Constitution prohibits us from uh, sentencing someone to jail or prison if just purely for failing to pay their fines. Uh, we have to be able to prove that they willfully did not pay, which is very difficult in a mm-hmm. lot of cases because some people are disabled or yeah. unemployed or and it's hard to, to actually go through that process of proving um, that they have had the money and they didn't pay. <laughs> so um, my thought is if we look at community service as a way of uh, holding them accountable for something they've done wrong, but allowing them to receive a higher uh, offset, I guess you would say, mm-hmm. than what they could otherwise make in the marketplace. For instance, if they're making $15 an hour and we were to you know, reduce their fines by, say, $20 per hour of community service, that's a benefit to the individual and it's also a benefit to our community. Okay. And you don't pull that person who's you know working... Um, maybe single, taking care of kids, fixed income or very limited income, you're not putting extra stress on them. Uh, and I think that's, I think when you look around our community, one thing I've noticed this campaign season is you drive a lot of these highways and county roads, there's a yeah. lot of trash uh, just sitting out there. And there's no reason for that. You know, we should be proud of our community. We should be proud mm-hmm. of Houston, Nevada County. And I think we could take care of that uh, if we just focused on community service and, uh, we need the money too, obviously. But yeah. An alternative to that yeah. would be community service. So that's two things I'm very um, interested. In. Another thing we've just started is residential substance abuse treatment program. Mm-hmm. Have you heard about that? Yes. The RSET program. We just finished our first class. We're about to start our second class, and I'm really proud of that program. Uh, a lot. Of, what a lot of people do not know is drug court is very successful. Um, it's a specialty court, but it is uh, limited to people that have not committed a violent or sexual offense. Um, Sexual offense is usually not an issue, but the violent offenses tend to keep people out of drug court. Another problem that I would like to see changed by the legislature is uh, if you complete drug court, and let's say you stay sober for 10 years um, and you relapse, uh, you can't go back to drug court. Well, then we're left with limited options for what we can do with that individual when we know that drug court worked for them in the past. Mm RSET helps fill that void to a degree, but also this program that we started is specifically for men. Um, hopefully we'll be able to expand that and include women, um, but it's, a, it's really a community-driven program focused on substance abuse, but also the whole person. It's faith-based, uh, which I think is very important. I think that's the only way that people are going to get out of mm-hmm. addiction is uh, if instead of... Uh, self-medicating their problems they you know yeah. turn to him and put them on him yeah um the uh one thing we we've seen is people will go they tend to go to rehab but they have to go to rehab somewhere that's not in Hempstead or Nevada County mm-hmm. and so they don't they get clean somewhere else but then when they come back home they're right around the same people yeah and so it's just this repeat rehab repeat rehab repeat some people have been able to stay clean and that's great Um, But this program is really designed to build a community of people that are working together to uh, overcome their addiction. Mm -hmm. And and, uh, that's a benefit for our community. Because one person, one addict, uh, one addict will 
take from themselves till they have nothing left to take. And then they take from their family members and they take um, until their family members cut them off and then they start taking from their community. Yeah. And so if we get those people clean, um, a lot of other crimes and uh, residual uh, effects of the addiction will clean themselves up. And that's a benefit for our community. Mm -hmm. Um, And when you go back to the numbers we were talking about with the prison, uh, what we're dealing with, that makes sense for us to focus on that too. So it's a a smart use of our resources. Mm -hmm. So, All right. How do you plan to involve citizens in your decision-making process? That's a good question. Um, I think you have uh, a lot of different aspects of that. Uh, depending on the nature of the problem. Mm -hmm. Um, Being a prosecutor, obviously juries are the easiest way to involve people in our decision-making process. The problem, of course, is it's very uh, difficult and disruptive to our community to have a jury trial because we're pulling people out of work. Mm -hmm. Most people don't like serving on a jury. (laughs) Um, And so they're usually trying to do everything they can to get out of it. So... The issue um, is, I think, really just educating people about what we're doing, uh, educating people about um, the programs that we have in place. Um, If a person has a complaint or a issue that they would like to know more about, I think the biggest part is just being more available. Um, The biggest thing that's important to me in that specific regard is I want to be much more visible to our victims. I want to be much more um, hands-on. With what I'm doing now as a deputy, it's very hard for me to focus on the victims as much as I would like to. Mm -hmm. Um, But that's what I really like doing is I like working with the victims um, of crimes because we have so many other crimes, drugs, uh, other things, you know, it's hard to only focus on victims and I think that's the biggest part in we think about what a crime is generally it's because there is some victim out there yeah and so even if it's drugs eventually there's a victim Mm -hmm. associated with it and that's really what crime is supposed to be is to you know uh, protect the society as a whole but to make you know to take up for the victims and uh, that's what I intend to do is be much more uh, available much more transparent um I've had some difficult conversations with some some parents about some some of their kids about you know what we have to do with the case, uh, but I think that's our responsibility as prosecutors. Uh, we play poker with our cards on the table. Mm-hmm. You know we don't pull any punches with the defend, defendants or the defense attorneys. Uh, they know exactly what we have, and that's the way it should be. Um, we should be able to do the same thing when we're talking about an offer that we may make to a defendant uh, to resolve a case look, you know, you may want probation or you may want something else, but you've been given too many chances and this is the end of the road for you. There's nothing else we can do. Um, And generally when I've taken the time to talk to the parent or the pastor usually, um, they get it and they, they, but they appreciate the transparency Mm -hmm. of knowing, have we done everything we can um, that doesn't involve prison? And we try to do that, but, uh, you know, sometimes there's some serious things, and that's really the only remedy for, for what happened. Mm-hmm. Or there's a defendant that's, you know, had one too many chances, and we've got to uh, hold them accountable. So. Well, and now for our, we're calling our fanciful creative question. If you were to receive a million-dollar grant to use in any way you wanted, what would you do with it and why? That's easy. The juveniles are the biggest need. Uh, we have made our grant. Budgets have really been cut uh, for um, troubled youth mm-hmm. in our state. Uh, there's a big push right now for <sighs> substance abuse for, for youth has been okay. cut almost entirely. Um, but really any kind of after-school programming. So if you think about a kid that gets in trouble at school or in the community, what's the first thing that happens? They get suspended or removed from extracurricular activities, which for our community... Uh, can seem like may seem like babysitting, but it's also taking up someone's time mm-hmm. in a positive way. So if they're suspended from those extracurricular activities, it creates a lot of extra time that they have to do a lot of bad things uh, in the community. 
So what we really need is we need um, we need some after school, after school programs, mm-hmm. like boys and girls clubs is yeah. you know, pretty common in bigger areas. Uh, but we need some after school programming um, for those kids that you know can't participate in extracurricular activities. That's a positive and not just running the streets. Mm-hmm. So uh, that's what I would like to see. I think there's a lot of good programs uh, that are in our community right now. Uh, one is um, it's called Oh Yeah. I don't know if you've heard of it. It's uh, it's pretty neat. The uh, Nevada County is doing it at, at Prescott, and uh, they are actually teaching like animal husbandry, and okay. so they're raising their animals, and then they're you know, actually you know selling the uh, you know the eggs and the yeah. uh, the meat from that. Um, I think anything like that that's a positive that exposes uh, a child to something that they may not get in your traditional public education, uh, that's a that's a great thing because uh, we know that not every kid is going to be a stellar A student or you know go to college. Mm-hmm. Uh, but that doesn't mean that that student doesn't have worth. Doesn't mean that they're not creative. You know, yeah. They may be artistic. They may have a real talent for uh, being <laughs> a farmer mm-hmm. and. Uh, but they may not have the resources or they mm-hmm. may not have grown up on a farm, you know. And so programs like that are really great programs because they allow uh, kids to be exposed to things that they might not otherwise be. And that's what we need to do if we got a million-dollar grant in our community. So. Okay. Thank you. Well, is there anything else you would like voters to know before they head to the polls? Yes. Uh, I think the, the biggest thing you should know about me is um, I know I'm – probably seem a little soft-spoken and uh, maybe even a little merciful. Um, but when I'm, when I'm in court, people know that I'm in business. Uh, but the prosecutor, prosecuting attorney's office is decisions we make have tremendous, tremendous consequences for everyone in our community. Um, if there is a way that we can hold people accountable uh, in our community, and allow them to remain in our community. We have a fiscal responsibility to do that with the state of affairs uh, in uh, as far as the prison resources. Because if we take someone that's a minor offender and we send them to prison and they ship out somebody to make room that's a more serious offender, our community suffers. Mm-hmm. So what we have to do as prosecutors is we have to make sure that when we have the serious cases, uh, we really make them count. And that's what I've tried to do as a prosecutor. That's what I'll continue to do as a prosecutor. I really believe in mercy uh, for first-time offenders, uh, for minor offenses, if at all possible. For substance abuse, we'll continue to uh, push people into drug court. And if they're not eligible for drug court, look at alternatives like the RCEP program that we've got started. And then the really violent people, the really uh, habitual offenders, Those are the people that my office will continue to drop the hammer on and remove them from our community so that we have a safe place to live here in Hempstead, Nevada County. Well, thank you so much for being with us today. And that's all we have for this segment of Coffee with the Candidates. from SWART Today and welcome to this segment of Coffee with the Candidates. We are coming to you from the SWART Today studios in downtown Hope and today I have Blake Montgomery who is a candidate for prosecuting attorney for Hempstead and Nevada counties, correct? That's right. Yeah, thank you for having me, April. Thank you so much for being here. Can you for our voters define the role of this office? Yeah, so the prosecutor is the uh, chief law enforcement officer uh, for Hempstead and Nevada counties. The prosecutor decides, uh, in the cases of uh, criminal defendants, decides who to charge uh, with crimes, decides what crimes to charge, and then uh, in the area of plea bargains, Mm -hmm. uh, the prosecutor will actually decide what uh, sentences to offer to a defendant uh, for them to accept to. So the prosecutor, uh, like I said, is the chief law enforcement officer of this district. Um, Everything having to do with the criminal justice system kind of starts and stops with the prosecuting attorney. Okay. Can you tell us a little bit about your background? Yeah, so I, uh, uh, I'm from Hope. Uh, I've, uh, my family's from Hope. Um, I went to Hope Public Schools. Uh, I went to uh, my last two years, I went to the Math and Science School in Hot Springs. 
I went to college at the University of Arkansas at Fayetteville. I graduated uh, in two years at the age of 19. And then I went to the University of Arkansas School of Law in Fayetteville. And I graduated there uh, a semester early. And uh, at, at age 22, mm -hmm. uh, I took the bar exam. I made the top score on the Arkansas bar exam. Uh, and then uh, I came back to Hope, immediately opened up my own practice. And then I've been doing that for the last seven years. And so I've been in small business for seven years. Mm -hmm. uh, I've got a, a firm now. Uh, my younger brother has basically done everything I did, and uh, he's practiced law with me too. And, uh, and then I have a, I'm married to my wife, Hannah, mm -hmm. and then we have a one-year-old named Andrew. And we're expecting another, uh, we're taking a little girl this July. Well, congratulations. Yeah, thank you so much. That's, that's me in a minute. <laughs> well, what experience specifically have prepared you for public office? Yeah, so in, in, in a prosecutor role, what you're looking for is you're looking for someone that has the capability uh, to um, uh, get uh, defendants convicted. Uh, what I mean by that is that you need someone who has the skills uh, requisite to present to a jury and to a judge uh, a victim side of the case. And so uh, if you know a, a defendant goes to a jury trial, that prosecutor is going to present the victim side of that case to that jury. And so you want to have someone who's capable, mm -hmm. uh, who can present to a jury, who can present to a judge. You also want to make sure that you have someone that's knowledgeable about the law. Yeah. And so uh, what I say by that is, is that uh, many times, you know, a prosecutor will get a conviction, uh, but then the defendant will appeal it to Little Rock. Mm -hmm. And then because of an error made by the prosecutor, oftentimes uh, the case will get reversed or yeah. re recent, you to retry the whole thing again. And so it's important to have a, a, a you know, good, a good presentation ability to a jury and then also be knowledgeable about the law. Um, and the, the most important thing, I think, uh, that I bring to this uh, to, to this office is I've uh, been in private industry for seven years, mm -hmm. and so uh, you know private industry has to be a little bit more efficient yeah. uh, than government does. And so uh, I'm looking to bring some of the private uh, private uh, industry efficiency into this government office. Uh, and so uh, I think what we'll see is we'll see uh, if I'm elected. I think we'll see a far more efficient court system. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the things. Uh, like, for example, today, uh, so uh, they're having criminal court in yeah. Hempstead County today, uh, felony criminal court. Well, there are 160 cases that are on the docket oh, for wow. today, and they all are st set to start at 9 o'clock. Yeah. Well, you can't do 160 cases at 9 o'clock. Mm -mm. And so what other counties have done uh, is they've started breaking up uh, their cases and say, we'll have, you know, 30 come at 9, we'll have 30 come at 11, okay. something like that. So. Uh, <laughs> that way, people don't have to spend all day in court. Uh, we also don't have too many extra people uh, in the courthouse, in the parking lot, that kind of thing. And so that's just one of the things uh, that we can do to uh, modernize, uh, create efficiency in that office, and to really, uh, my personal thing, to respect our citizens' time. Yeah. Uh, because even if you are you know, guilty of a crime, they still got a family. Yeah. And so that family's going to sit there and watch them. We don't need the family to sit there 12 hours. Yeah. Uh, that's not, I don't think that's respectful of our mm -hmm. citizens' time. So we can be more efficient in the way that we handle uh, at just, just, just for example, just the criminal court system, just that, that area of it, we can be more efficient that way. Yeah. And so that's one of, the, one of the things I'd like to bring. Okay. What or who inspired you to run for this office? I've been running for this job for seven years. <laughs> uh, the, uh, um, I've, uh, uh, when I came back, to, uh, came back to Hope, I wanted to be a uh, deputy prosecutor. Yeah. Uh, we, um, at that time, there were no part-time deputy prosecutors, and so um, uh, there were just the full-time deputy jobs. And so uh, I didn't want to do that because I still wanted to practice law. I'm glad I did that. Uh, because when I started seven years ago, there were seven law firms in Hope. Yeah. Now there are two law firms in Hope. And so we've lost uh, several lawyers. Some have, uh, not, uh, some have gone away maybe dishonorably, but some have gone away just due to medical reasons, retirement, mm -hmm. that kind of thing. And so, uh, so Hope uh, is short lawyers. Yeah. And so I'm glad that I was able to serve uh, in you know, private industry as a you know, for-hire private lawyer. Someone has to do people's wills, you know, mm -hmm. that, that has to happen. And so, um, but I've always wanted to do this. I've always wanted to be uh, in prosecution. One of my uh, kind of, you, you, when you said who inspired mm -hmm. me, uh, my grandfather, Lynn Montgomery, okay. he was uh, Justice of the Peace in Hempstead County 
for uh, like 53, 54 yeah. years. And so he ran when he was 21, uh, for Justice of the Peace here, and then he went all the way until 2018, I believe, or 2020. And uh, and he only had one one break in between when they had consolidated a district in the 70s. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, I, you know, the our state of Arkansas doesn't keep records of these things. But I believe he's probably the longest serving elected official in the history of the state of Arkansas. He did 54 years elected, I think. And um, and so you know, my grandfather uh, brought uh, to the quorum court as just the piece brought. Uh, he's a farmer, and he was a, for briefly he was a used car salesman. A lot of people don't know that. That was what his first first deal was. He had a used car lot over by the uh, by Madlocks, and um, uh, but he brought you know those uh, that knowledge mm -hmm. to county government, and he uh, brought uh, private uh, you know business efficiencies to county government. And for 50 years, Hempstead County has had a balance sheet to be envied. Um, there's always been reserved money there. Uh, while he was there, and I think that's been kind of one of his proudest accomplishments is mm -hmm. how well he's maintained the county budget while he was there. He is someone I look up to. You know, I hate to, I hate to break it to the voters. Uh, I'm not as good as he is. Uh, <laughs> I'm not a. Uh, I'm not as good as my granddad is. I didn't tell you that. Um, but um, uh, but he's someone I look up to, uh, and he's uh, he's an uh, to me an example of someone who can spend their life in public service. Yeah. So you would say he's been a role model? For sure, no doubt, no doubt about it. Well, should you become elected? You discussed earlier a little bit about the time management. Mm -hmm. Are there any other issues or concerns you would like to address? Yeah, so, um, uh, so, like, yeah, so like I said, we can do a better job, you know, the prosecutor's office can do a better job of um, kind of just running that docket. Yeah. Um, that can be a better way, and both, there are better things that can be done both on scheduling the docket and, you know, working the docket before you get to court. Mm -hmm. uh, that's something that, uh, that needs to change. I'll tell you uh, something that, that's kind of near and dear to my heart that I look to bring to this, uh, this office. So uh, if I'm elected, I intend on having the deputy prosecutor jobs become part-time jobs, mm -hmm. uh, if not all of them, all but one of them, I think. And so, um, and the reason I want to do that is, is because you, we can take... Uh, we can attract uh, lawyers to come here if we give them a part-time government job mm -hmm. that gives them retirement, health insurance, and gives them a base salary every month. Not you know, not not enough to get rich, but enough to live on. Yeah. Uh, and uh, I know because I I did that. You know, when I opened up my practice, I didn't have a government job. I went straight into private industry. There were some months I did okay, but for the first couple three years, it was tough. You know, and um, uh, but I didn't have a family at the time, mm -hmm. so it was okay. But uh, but we can attract. Uh, lawyers to come back in this area uh, to, um, you know, we can help them use these government jobs in rural counties to, um, uh, uh, to attract lawyers to come back and, uh, and then also practice law. So Hempstead and Nevada counties are the only counties in southwest Arkansas that don't have part-time deputy prosecutors. Okay. Even Texarkana has part-time deputy prosecutors. And so those, those uh, attorneys that serve as deputy prosecutors, they also practice law. And so they know how, um, you know, how to interact with their clients. They know, they know the difficulties placed on lawyers, uh, on defense lawyers even. And so uh, Hempstead and Nevada County is unique in that way. Uh, and I think that that is one of the reasons to blame as to why uh, we don't have any of the lawyers in town. Yeah. Uh, I think that's a big problem. Uh, Nashville, Magnolia, El Dorado, Texarkana, Arkadelphia, Dequeen, Ashdown, all of them use uh, part-time deputy prosecutors so that there can still be private lawyers to provide resources and mm -hmm. services for the citizenry. So that'll be, some, that'll be kind of the main, my main thing I want to do. I, uh, when, I first opened up my, when I first opened up my practice, I was asked to write an article for the American Bar Association mm -hmm. about uh, rural lawyering, mm -hmm. and so I wrote I wrote an article. And at that point in time, uh, there were uh, four firms uh, in town. They were kind of they were we were losing them pretty quick. But there were four firms, and uh, at that point in time, uh, there were I'd figured up the population in Hempstead County. There were 6,300 people for every lawyer oh, wow. in Hempstead County, and so if you compared that to like New York City. So if mm -hmm. you took that same ratio and took it to New York City, there would only be like 900 lawyers in New York City. And so we're all overworked. Um, I'm overworked. I turn cases down every day. Um, we need more lawyers in Hempstead County. Okay. And Hempstead County deserves uh, lawyers that um, uh, are capable. Uh, we deserve capable. We don't deserve Little Rock's rejects. Uh, we deserve the very best and brightest, the yeah. same any other county does. 
And so um, by using these government jobs, these government resources, we can help attract lawyers to come back into town and give back to the community. Okay, thank you. How do you plan to involve citizens in your decision-making process? Yeah, so um, a lot of people don't realize how much power a prosecuting attorney has. Mm -hmm. And so that's been, uh, I have a Facebook page, uh, Blake Montgomery for Prosecuting Attorney, and on Facebook, and I've done a series of videos uh, on there, and the first video was simply about what is a prosecuting attorney. It was about four minutes long, and uh, it's just to educate the citizenry yeah. about what this job is. And so like we talked about, you know, the prosecutor decides who to charge, decides what to charge them with, and then in a plea bargain, and a plea bargain is, uh, that's like 99% of cases as a national average are resolved by plea bargain. Really? And so in a plea bargain, you'll have the prosecutor's the one that decides the punishment. So the prosecuting attorney uh, decides who to, who, who to charge, what to charge them with, and what the punishment should be. No judge, no jury does, decides any of that. That's the prosecutor does that. By educating the citizens, uh, first and foremost during this election, we can educate them. And then secondly, our citizens have a right to know, uh, I believe they have a right to know, what's going on in our court system. Mm -hmm. And so uh, there's, there's two things that I'd like to talk about. One, uh, so there's an attorney general race going on right now. Yeah. And one of the candidates, uh, he's talking about, uh, uh, Tim Griffin, is talking about transparency in sentencing. Okay. And so right now in the state, uh, in the state of Arkansas, you can have a jury sentence someone to, let's say, 20 years. Well, they'll, uh, because of the way the Department of Corrections calculates time and the parole and probation and all that stuff, uh, you can have people out in four years or really? even less. And so a jury <laughs> thinks they're sentencing someone to 20 years, uh -huh. but in reality they're only getting four or five. Yeah. And so uh, I think from a statewide perspective, uh, we need to have more transparency in our sentencing uh, so that way our juries know uh, what it is that they're, that they're doing. If a jury says they want someone to do 20 years, then they need to do 20 years. Yeah. It's a jury's right to, right to decide that. Uh, secondly, uh, I, I would like to uh, implement a, uh, what I want people to understand is that uh, in the criminal justice system in Hempstead and Nevada counties, the buck stops with the prosecutor's office. And so if someone is let go, uh, if, if someone's got charges dropped, if someone's, uh, if, a, a jury let, if a jury lets a defendant go, uh, or if someone's overcharged or, you know, thinks being too, uh, the punishment's been too severe, people need to know that's the prosecutor's responsibility and that's the prosecutor's choices. And so what I intend to, to do if I'm elected is to present a, a press release Mm -hmm. uh, uh, maybe every month or maybe more often as to um, uh, what's going on okay. uh, in the office and so I can present and say these are you know the cases that were resolved this month okay. uh, these are the sentences that were done this is how it was done that can be run in the paper yeah. uh, you know that's not that wouldn't be a problem everything's public record almost mm -hmm. and so uh, it wouldn't be hard to do that take a little bit of time and effort yeah. to do it but I think our citizens need to know uh, and, and, and the other thing like I said this you know, if, if I'm elected, uh, I'm probably going to do things that s someone's not going to like. You can't make everybody happy. You know, this mm -hmm. is not a job where you sell ice cream. And so, uh, uh, but, but people need to know uh, that that's my responsibility. Mm -hmm. And so I don't need to hide behind someone and say, oh, well, uh, the sheriff's office, the, the, you know, the sh I hear this so many times. Oh, well, the, the sheriff's deputies didn't bring us the file. Or, oh, the, the cop didn't, uh, didn't write the ticket right or anything like that. No, that's, that's buck passing, you know. Yeah. Uh, the, the buck stops the prosecutor's office. So the people need to know that, uh, whether, whether they like it or not. Uh, they need to know that, that that's what's going on. And so that's one of the things I, I hope to bring in, in some extra transparency uh, people can see. And they may not agree with the decisions, yeah. uh, but they'll know that that's, you know, that's, that's how it was. I see. Yeah. All right. Is there anything else, if you're elected, whether it's um, maybe you want to improve administration of the office, or is there anything at all you think voters need to know about what you have to offer? Yeah, so I... Um, you know, I, uh, um, I don't work in the prosecutor's office now. Um, I've been in private industry uh, for seven years. Uh, I have been a small business owner for seven years. Uh, I've represented close to 2,000 clients. I've represented uh, businesses. I've represented governments. I've represented clients in, uh, I think, 18 different counties. I've represented them in state and federal court in both Arkansas and Texas. Uh, I, am a, uh, uh, I think I'm a capable lawyer. Uh, I think that if I'm elected, uh, I will be able to, uh, I have the ability uh, to represent the victims of Hempstead and Nevada County as well. Uh, 
Uh, I believe that uh, uh, through the, the changes I want to make, I can improve the administration of justice in Hempstead and Nevada counties, uh, both for uh, other lawyers. Uh, you know, this is, this is other lawyers' job. You know, this yeah. is their workplace. And so you can, you know, you can disagree without being disagreeable, mm -hmm. you know. And so, uh, and so I can improve the administration of justice that way. Uh, and I think, I, hopefully, I can bring uh, uh, support, prosecutor support, to our law enforcement officers who are actually on the streets every day. Uh, I've had a, you know, I've done, uh, uh, through the course of my practice, I've done a few criminal defense cases. Uh, not because I want to be a criminal defense lawyer, but because, uh, you know, I have to uh, pay my mortgage. <laughs> and, so, uh, and so I've done a few, and I, and I know exactly, uh, and, I, and I know this because I've seen it, we have uh, law enforcement officers who, very, who care very much about the administration of justice yeah. and care a lot about, and, and I can tell they care a lot about the citizens that they come into contact with. You know, just because you're accused of a crime or even just because you committed a crime doesn't necessarily, necessarily mean you're a bad person. Yeah. Everyone makes mistakes. Um, but I can tell that they, that they care a lot. But what I can also tell is that they're not getting a lot of training mm -hmm. uh, from the prosecutor's office. They're not getting a lot of support from the prosecutor's office. And so I hope to uh, provide that additional support mm -hmm. and training to law enforcement here in Hempstead and Nevada counties. Uh, because I've been in so many different counties, like I said, I've uh, represented clients in 18, 20 different counties all over southwest Arkansas. Uh, I know how it's run in other counties. And I know that it can be done better than how it's being done here. Mm -hmm. And so I hope to bring that change here. All right. Last question. If you were to receive, let's say, a million dollar grant, what would you do with it and why? Um, yeah, I, uh, I don't like this question. Uh, <laughs> the, uh, uh, I, could go on a, I could go on a tirade about uh, uh, grants or not free money. Uh, uh, I guess the right answer is to be give it back to the taxpayers. Uh, but, uh, but if I had to spend it, uh, I think what I would do is I would focus on um, uh, some sort of uh, uh, drug rehabilitation program okay. here in Hempstead and Nevada counties. I know there's been the start of a drug rehab program here. Uh, it's, it's in its infancy. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't think we've, we, have, we don't have anywhere near enough data to know whether or not it's working yeah. or not. It's modeled after a very successful program in Sevier County in Dequain, uh, which is very, 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 very successful. And so hopefully we can have that same success that they have there. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, but I, uh, I deal with, uh, so in my, in my church, uh, I've been involved in our recovery ministry at my yeah. church, and I've actually taken quite a few uh, clients from my office to our recovery ministry. And so mm -hmm. I've seen a few of my clients who were living in addiction have found you know, freedom okay. uh, from addiction. And so I know that uh, that's the most, really the most valuable thing you can give someone uh, when, a, when a person with a drug addiction comes into contact with law enforcement. I see that as an opportunity uh, to break them free of their addiction. Mm -hmm. And so if we have the tools in place uh, to help them, uh, to guide them, encourage them, and, and I, I think I've said this on maybe one of my videos or uh, somewhere on Facebook, you know, when it comes to drug addiction, the one thing that it takes is the one thing we don't want to give it, and that's time. Yeah. Uh, it takes someone's time uh, to, to spend with people. We try to throw money at it, but really what it takes, it takes invested employees, invested volunteers, who have a heart uh, of ministry of reaching these people um, who are who are struggling, you know, who you know, and um, uh, and so um, that's kind of where I, I, it's kind of what I have a heart for. Uh, I don't uh, I don't think people. Uh, I've I've known several people to get sober. I've never known someone to get sober through prison. Uh, prison hasn't. Okay. I haven't known anyone to get sober through prison. I have seen rehab work several times out of town, but I do think that we need more resources here in Hempstead, Nevada County. It's uh, it's hard to get sober in the town that you get uh, uh, that you uh, use drugs in. It's mm -hmm. hard to get sober in that same town. Uh, you have to shed all your friends. You have to yeah. find new friends, and so it's hard to do. So if we can focus on establishing resources here, uh, you know, Friday nights, Saturday nights, those are times where people, uh, when they decide, when you know, someone makes a decision, I want to quit drinking, I want to quit using drugs. Well, then that Friday or Saturday night comes around, and what they're normally used to doing, they don't they don't do. So we have to replace that with something else. Yeah. And so uh, that's what I think our, our criminal justice system can do, uh, if we had a million dollars and I couldn't <laughs> give it back to the taxpayers. Any last words or any thoughts you would like viewers or voters to know? Yes. Um, in this election, uh, no matter if you're going to vote for me or not, uh, I'd like you to get informed. 
Uh, I want you to be informed about this office. I want you to be informed about the people running. I want you to make an informed decision. And I want you to take that informed decision and go vote. Um, I can expect um, that probably only 20% uh, of the people of Hempstead and Nevada counties will actually go vote in May. Mm -hmm. And so um, I would love it if we'd have more, but that's probably what all we're going to have. And so um, uh, get yourself educated and then go vote. In Hempstead County, you can vote early, uh, May 9th uh, through May 23rd. That'll be at the new courthouse uh, downtown in Hempstead County. And in, in Nevada County, you can vote early, uh, same time, just at the Nevada County courthouse. And then on election day, you can find your polling place uh, through the county clerk's office. Uh, but um, uh, thank you so much for having me, April. And I really appreciate uh, you letting me come on. Thank you for joining us. And that'll be all for this segment of Coffee with the Candidates.